It doesn't happen very often from my understanding. Okay. Yeah. There's still a lot we don't know about Lyme disease because it's only been, we've only known about it since the 1970s. So. Uh, In the 70s, just out of curiosity, what was the trigger for the original attention to it in the 70s? The nine-year-olds with arthritis. Oh, the nine-year-olds. The nine-year-olds in Lyme, Connecticut with arthritis. But well, why was there an outbreak in Connecticut, Lyme, Connecticut at that point? I don't know. So a lot of people are uh, uh, heard about Powassan virus, uh, especially earlier this year, um, where we had a couple of cases that were diagnosed. Powassan virus is different from what we've uh, the diseases we've already talked about because Powassan virus is an arbovirus. It's a virus. There's not much you can really do about a virus. Um, with bacterial infections, you can treat it with antibiotics. With parasitic infections, you can treat it with antiparasites. With viral infections, it's just mostly supportive care. Um, Powassan virus uh, is um, the only tick-borne arboviral disease found in the United States. Um, as opposed to all the other tick-borne illnesses we've talked about, Powassan virus can also be carried by the woodchuck tick, which is that lovely looking grayish mass right there. That's an engorged woodchuck tick with the edge of a penny um, for scale purposes. That's what it looks like when it's not engorged. Ixodes cookie eye. Um, it is a rare disease. We've only had a handful of cases diagnosed in the state. Um, we've had cases in 2013, 2015, 2016, and this past year. Um, it is a very severe disease. Um, many of the people who are infected with Powassan virus uh, die from it. Um, part of that is because it causes severe swelling of the um, neural tissues. And even if somebody survives a Powassan infection, um, the recovery period can be really long because the brain tissue is so swollen and inflamed that it can take um, a long time to recover from that. Uh, the scary thing about Powassan virus is how quickly it can be transmitted from a tick. Um, so uh, in a lot of the newspaper articles, they were talking about 15 minutes. 15 minute transmission. If you don't even know that you have a tick on you, how are you gonna know that one was on you for like 15 minutes or, or you know, more than that. Um, so this is the article that uh, refers to that specific study. They looked at, they had a bunch of mice <laughs> and they had a bunch of nymphal ticks infected with Powassan virus. And they timed it to see how long uh, after tick attachment um, it would take for the mice to then be diagnosed with or have Powassan uh, virus in their bloodstream, and the average was 15 minutes. So that's the article where that comes from. Now, again, that was mice. We are humans. It's a little bit a different thing, but there's still a lot of uh, reason to be concerned about that. The good news, though, is that um, Powassan virus is a very rare disease. We're talking about less than five cases. I think there's been three cases this year, um, and in prior years, it's only been like one or two. So very rare disease very severe disease. Um, if you do have symptoms of um, Powassan virus, uh, symptoms um, include a headache, confusion, uh, other kind of altered mental status, um, lack of coordination. Usually if, um, if you are infected with Powassan virus, your symptoms will be so severe um, that you will probably need to go to a hospital. Um, there are some cases of people who are infected and have super mild symptoms. Again, those generalized flu-like symptoms, never know it, just kind of swept under the rug because it was never that bad. So the only cases we do find out about are the ones that are super severe, go to the hospital and have a lab test that's sent out to Fort Collins and comes back four weeks later. By the way, you have Powassan virus. Kind of same thing like as Eastern Equine Encephalitis or West Nile virus. Yes? What do we know about the two earlier ones you mentioned in terms of transmission time? Uh, with Lyme disease, and you need to have a tick. Not Lyme, but more the anaplasma. Anaplasma, babesiosis. It's less than 24 hours, but I think more than 12. I don't know that one right uh, committed to memory. I think the average is about 16 to 18 hours. Um, so, 
there are other tick-borne illnesses. Um, we're, we've got about 15 more minutes. Um, especially if you go out of state, uh, you could be at risk for these other tick-borne illnesses. Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, which is carried by the dog tick. This is a time when you need to be concerned about the dog tick if you find it on you. Um, especially if you go in the southern area or in the uh, Rocky Mountain area. So Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, um, you get a rash on your palm and so is your feet, headache. Uh, testing is done by serology. Uh, ehrlichiosis, which is possibly one of my favorite things to say. <laughs> It's carried by the Lone Star Tick, um, which is typically not found in Maine. Uh, symptoms again, fever, headache, nausea, body aches. Uh, if you have been bitten by a tick while you were traveling out of state and you develop flu-like symptoms, let your doctor know. Um, because they may not routinely test for these things unless they know where you have been. Uh, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. Anybody listen to Radio Lab, the podcast? Ooh, yes. Uh, so there is a pod uh, a couple of, maybe about a year ago, they were talking about a um, alpha gal, which is a specific allergy that people can develop to red meat that is kind of associated with Rocky Mountain spotted fever infection. So ooh, <laughs> I do not want to live in a world where I can't have a hamburger. Um, uh, there's other tick-borne illnesses, including Borrelia miyamotoi. Um, that is one that is found in Maine, not very common. We don't know all that much about it. Um, it was first diagnosed in, um, first identified in 1995. The first uh, cases were being identified in Maine in 2016. Stay tuned. We're still figuring this one out. Very similar to Lyme disease. Same family as Lyme disease. Same kind of symptoms as Lyme disease. So if it's not Lyme disease, anaplasmosis, or babesiosis, it might be this one too. So, and People can get multiple infections at the same time. So some people can actually get Lyme disease and anaplasmosis at the same time, so. This beautiful piece of artwork was done by a uh, student. Um, we have a annual poster contest um, where kids uh, have a theme and then they submit a, uh, their posters for that theme. This one was inspect and protect. What's the prize? Getting your poster published by the Maine CDC. All right. Fortune, fame, and glory, and being a part of a public health campaign. <laughs> so now that we talked about all these scary, greebly diseases, let's talk about what you can do to prevent getting infected with these diseases. What can you do? So the best offense is a good defense. Um, the best way to not get a tick-borne illness is to not get a tick bite in the first place. So uh, we really strongly support personal protection. Um, so dress appropriately when outdoors. I am hoping that at some point the kids will catch on and this will become a fashionable thing. Jeans and socks. Hashtag, hashtag jeans and socks. Um, so wear long-legged pants, wear tall socks, high boots, uh, long-legged clothes, or long arm clothes, long arm sleeves. Uh, wear light-colored clothing. You're more likely to see a tick crawling on you on light-colored background versus a dark-colored background. Um, uh, use personal repellents if you choose, uh, especially ones that are, we specifically recommend one that's, ones that are approved by the EPA, uh, ones that contain DEET, oil of lemon eucalyptus, IR3535, picaridin, or permethrin. Permethrin treats your clothing or your camping gear. It doesn't treat your skin. Please do not apply permethrin to your skin. And in fact, only use any personal repellent according to the label. <laughs> Cannot emphasize that enough. Um, uh, if you do uh, go outdoors, as many of us probably do, we recommend that when you come in from being outdoors, take your clothes off, toss them in the dryer before you wash them. Again, the, if it dries, deer ticks will die. So you need to dry out the deer ticks before you send them through the washer because they actually might live through a wash cycle. Um, and you don't want them crawling around and getting out and into your household. Uh, so thoroughly wash and dry your clothes, high heat, high setting, will probably take care of them. Um, and then, uh, yeah, that's, I still really hope that the socks come into fashion. Um, and do a daily tick check. I know that a lot of us already do this, but it can't hurt to send the message home again. Um, by sight, by touch, if you feel a bump, if you see a freckle moving, it's probably a tick. Uh, so uh, inspect your body after being outdoors and again a few hours later because you might have missed something in the first place. 
Um, pay attention to specific areas where moisture likes to hang out. So nape of your neck, armpits, waist, between your legs, your thighs, behind your knees, recruit help if you can. If you can't have somebody there to help you, get a hand mirror, especially like a magnifying one, um, and uh, get a larger mirror in front of you so you can get a better angle. And do a tick check on your pets as well. If your pets are outdoor animals, they can bring them in with you, especially if, I don't know about you, but my cat is super cuddly, especially as it's starting to get cold at night. And uh, even though she's not an outdoor cat, um, I imagine that if she was, she has the chance to bring one in and bring a tick into the bed as she snuggles up right next to me. So um, I know that some animals uh, can be treated with a tick treatment, which is fantastic, but it only works if the tick actually bites their skin. If they're crawling around in the fur, it's not gonna do anything. So some people, I've had plenty of people said like, I never go outdoors, my animals go outdoor, and I found ticks in my bed. What do I do? And I said, well, do a tech check on your animal. Some people swear by having like the lint roller or the lint brush by the front door and as soon as their animal comes in, they'll pick up the ticks that way. Uh, other people swear by vacuum cleaners. My cat does not like that. <laughs> the vacuum cleaner, the uh, monster that screams and eats at the same time. <laughs> so check yourself, check your pets, check your loved ones. Uh, Again, with these ticks, especially nymphal ticks in the middle of summer, they can be super tiny, the size of a pinhead. So you do need to look thoroughly. The common areas are circled here. Um, and what do you do if you, well, let's talk about first what you can do to make your yard safer, and then we'll talk about how to get a tick off of you when you find one. Uh, so you can do things to make your yard safer. Uh, remove brush, leaf litter, and tall grass. We recommend keeping your grass at three inches or less in order to minimize the moisture. Um, in your ground, which helps deer ticks live. Uh, create a dry border between the woods and the lawn. Um, crushed gravel, something that, a specific area that helps dry the ticks out if they're being tracked out. And then also, it's kind of a visual warning for you to say, by the way, if you cross this barrier, you're going into a tick zone, so you wanna be a little bit extra careful. Uh, remove plants that attract deer and construct physical barriers that might discourage deer from uh, entering your yard, if feasible. Not everybody has that opportunity to do that. Um, uh, in addition to deer, white-footed mice are a common source for ticks. Ticks like to hang out on white-footed mice before they transition over to other um, bigger animals. So if you have uh, areas where white-footed mice like to hang out, so uh, messy wood piles, for instance, try to keep your wood piles nice and tidy um, and at a distance from your doorway that is far enough, but not too far because winter can suck. So you don't want to have to go out and try to get some wood that's too far away. So you find a tick on you, what do you do? Uh, panic a little, no, don't panic. Scream a little internally. <laughs> you could do two things. Uh, we have some tick spoons here for you to take home if you want. Or if you have tweezers at home, they work just as fine. If you have tweezers, you wanna grasp the tick as close as you can to the skin um, and then pull gently until the tick lets go. Um, don't try to jerk or don't try to squish the body. You wanna to try to grab as close to the head. They will leave mouth parts behind. That, that hypostome, that barbed mouthpiece, they will leave something behind. You don't need to worry about the mouthpiece. You don't need to worry about the mouth parts. The mouth parts don't have the infection. It's their stomach contents that have the infection. So we discourage anything that will squeeze the body or cause the tick to eject the contents of its stomach into you. Um, if you use a tick spoon, uh, you wanna place the wide spot. So the tick spoon's got this little notch worked into it. So you wanna take the wide spot, keep the skin taut, place the wide part of the notch perpendicular to the tick body, and then just kind of slide the spoon until it gets into that, the tick gets into that little notch there, and then just continue sliding and gently scoop up, and the tick will pop into this convenient little spoon so you don't have to like run around with a set of tweezers going, what do I do with the tick now? So. Is that an old product? I mean, the tick spoon, or is it fairly recent? It's not too recent. I, I don't think it's too recent, but I mean, I'm not an old product, so I don't know. It works very well. It works very well. And you can keep one in your car. You don't have to worry about poking your eyes out with the tweezers. So some people really like them. But you know, the tweezers are also have their purpose in terms of especially it's super hard to reach spots or areas where there's a lot of hair. 
Um, what we do not recommend, do not use a match head, do not use oil, petroleum jelly, lighted cigarette. Anything that might startle the tick and cause it to eject its stomach contents into you is bad. You want to try to avoid that at all costs. That might hasten the inf you being coming infected with something if it's infected with that. So. Yes. Yes. Talk soothingly to the tick. Just let go. Let it go. Yeah. Eyes or something, or smoking cigarettes in terms of <coughs> who knows? Who knows? People, people do a lot of really creative things when they when it comes to bugs. Okay. So um, but really tweezers, tick spoon, try to get it off of you as easily and as quickly as possible, but try not to squeeze the body. Okay? Okay. Uh, once you have the tick, what do you do? Once it's off of you. Um, uh, if you have rubbing alcohol, or alcohol alcohol, I suppose, um, you can preserve your tick in rubbing alcohol. Um, it will die. Uh, it doesn't like rubbing alcohol. I mean, most people don't. It's kind of gross. It's very useful, but it smells icky. Uh, so on the off chance you do have a tick on you, if you preserve it in a rubbing alcohol, you also then have it preserved so it can be identified by your doctor or by somebody else later to figure out, is this a deer tick that I need to worry about? Or is this one of those other 14 ticks that are found in the state of Maine that I don't really need to worry about transmitting disease? Um, again, washing your clothes will not kill your tick. However, drying your clothes on high heat before you wash them will kill ticks. So make sure you wash them, when and put them in the dryer before you put them in the washer if you have a set of clothes that you, you're using to go outdoors. Boop. Are you soliciting ticks that haven't bit, bit anyone? Or are you inundated with ticks and not just throwing them away when you get them? Or I don't have anything to do with the tick solicitation. The Cooperative Extension does. Uh, so, the University of Maine or no Cooperative Extension uh, does accept ticks. They will identify the tick for you. They will let you know what kind of tick it was. Um, uh, you should visit this web page to learn more about submitting ticks for identification. They do have some specific details. Um, uh, these slides will be made available later, by the way. So. Have you sent in a tick yourself? No, because I haven't found a tick on me. Um, uh, so if you do submit a tick, you want to send it in a crush-proof, waterproof container and rubbing alcohol. Um, the tick species and the degree of engorgement will be identified. So they'll figure out how long was it possibly on you. What they will not do is test the tick for disease. Some labs will test ticks for, the, for Lyme disease or other diseases, but again, just because a tick was on you doesn't necessarily mean that they transmitted disease to you. So figuring out whether that tick had the disease or not isn't really going to help you nearly as much as you paying attention to yourself after you've been bitten to see if you do develop symptoms of an illness. Uh, this is one of the posters we have over there with some examples of, again, the deer ticks versus dog ticks that you can take home with you and some suggestions for tick removal. Um, we don't really have all that much time, so I won't spend too much time about mosquito-borne illnesses because I want to respect your evening. Um, but if you're concerned about Powassan virus, then certainly by all means you should also be concerned about Eastern Equine Encephalitis, or Triple E, and West Nile virus. Um, so uh, there are a lot of mosquito-borne infections in the world. The mosquito is the number one killer of people, um, in that malaria kills more people than a lot of other things. Um, and Eastern Equine Encephalitis and West Nile virus are also um, infections that can severely harm or make you sick. But it's very rare. So there are 45 different mosquito species in Maine. Uh, less than half are vectors for these uh, infections. Um, there are different habitats where these specific mosquito vectors like to hang out in. So the one that um, carries eastern equine encephalitis likes to hang out in boggy swamp areas, so pretty much most of Maine. Um, mature hemlock, clear tea-colored water, peat bottom, acidic areas. These mosquitoes emerge early in spring and they overwinter as larvae and there's multiple they're bird biters primarily, but they're also equal opportunists. They will bite whatever they can get their little mosquito proboscises on. Um, the West Nile vi virus vector habitats tend to be the standing water. So uh, forgotten 
tires and flower pots and uh, catch basins and uh, fairly neglected bird baths. Um, so you can take care of this one really easy by making sure you don't have standing water on your property. Can't really do much about bogs. Um, they're generalists, they'll eat, they'll, they'll bite almost anything. So humans though are dead end hosts. Large animals are dead end hosts for Eastern equine encephalitis and um, West Nile virus, which means that if we become infected with this, then we can't pass it on to anything if we are bitten by mosquitoes. West Nile virus and Eastern equine encephalitis are primarily transmitted between mosquitoes and birds. And then every now and then an infected mosquito will bite a horse, a human, a llama or an emu, and that person may become infected with this. They might have super mild symptoms. Um, most people who are infected with this will never have any symptoms of being infected. They don't even know. Their immune system is like, all right, whatever, I'll take care of that. Um, but for those who do develop symptoms, sometimes they can be super mild, fever, headache, body ache, the flu-like symptoms that pretty much precede almost anything. Um, and then for some people, they develop really severe illness, so neuroinvasive disease where um, uh, brain tissue swells up. Symptoms usually last one to two weeks, and the only thing you could do is provide supportive treatment. Uh, there is no specific cure or treatment for uh, West Nile virus or Eastern equine encephalitis. But the number of cases diagnosed are very rare. So we do a um, pool, we sample pools of mosquitoes to see how many mosquitoes um, in those specific pools are infected with these, uh, these specific viruses. And uh, we had a couple, uh, we had some mosquitoes in 2013 and 2014 that had Eastern equine encephalitis. Um, but typically we really don't see many of these cases in the state. That's not to say that we're completely free from them, it's just, it's a rare disease. So fight the bite. Again, some of the uh, same things that you do for tick prevention will also work for mosquito prevention, including personal repellents, wearing long sleeve clothes and pants, not, which isn't fun in the middle of summer, but um, other things you can do is also um, draining artificial sources of water, taking extra precautions, especially at dusk and dawn. And now that we're coming into the winter season, we don't have to worry about it as much, thankfully. I'm like, I'm, I'm a buffet for mosquitoes. <laughs> My boyfriend likes to joke around that he likes keeping me around because the mosquitoes will come to me and completely ignore him. Um, so, for more information, what do you do if you have questions? You can contact us at the main CDC, 1-800-821-5821 is our 24-hour seven days a week disease reporting and consultation line. Um, if it is not an urgent matter, we probably won't get back to you until you know working hours Monday through Friday, but if you do have a super, super urgent like question, like a rabies related question, um, that's the number to call. Uh, you can also email us at disease.reporting at maine.gov or visit us on the webpage. Um, this is the webpage for the vector-borne disease uh, website, but I prefer maine.gov slash IDEPI, IDEPI, Infectious Disease Epidemiology. Um, the Maine Medical Center Research Institute Vector-Borne Disease Lab is a fantastic resource if you want to get into the nitty-gritty about ticks. Um, and the University of Maine Cooperative Extension is one of our fantastic partners who really help us out in reaching out to people to do tick-borne prevention. So, thank you so much for your time. Thank That's you. my contact information. Yes. Tick tubes. <laughs> tick tubes. They work. Uh, so you're talking about the the tubes with the cotton with permethrin in them. Right. And then the mice take the cotton back to their abodes, and there isn't any evidence to support it, unfortunately, um, and. Uh, because ticks are found in a lot of different places. And so it might take care of ticks in that specific family of mice, but it might not take care of the neighboring mice. And then those neighboring mice still have, you know, ticks on them, and then it gets I transmitted it over. And, uh, later on in the summer, I found a bird's nest that had fallen, and the birds had used part of the cotton. Oh, that's fantastic, trees. yeah. Fantastic for the bird? Uh, well, not fantastic for the bird. The bird, I, well, I mean, yeah. So there's also concern about what happens when you introduce a uh, insecticide that's meant for treating clothes into the environment willy-nilly. So. Yeah, that's not me, so thank you. Yeah. Uh, boop, 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 which one? Okay. You first. You talked a lot about ticks and Lyme disease and co-infections. You didn't mention mosquitoes, dead lice, spiders, anything else that bites the vector that then bites the human. There are abstract studies that show that a lot of other insects can transmit disease. 
Uh, if there are diseases um, that are identified that are of an infectious matter, uh, it gets reported to us. I mean, we do have um, we do have certain cases where we know it's a fairly common thing, and so we keep a close eye on those. But if there are uh, outliers, then um, those cases get reported to us. And then if there is a note of public health concern, then we start investigating more. So, so there are some research abstracts mm -hmm. out related to specifically to several different Right. At the moment, the ones, we haven't had many other weird vector-borne illnesses other than the ones that we routinely investigate. So Maine is a little bit, we're a little bit lucky as far as our climate goes in that we don't have the burden of insects that do carry a lot of other diseases as opposed to like equatorial areas. But that's, you know, we are keeping an eye out for things that might creep up the coastline, like ehrlichiosis, which is found in, you know, um, uh, lone star ticks. So if we start to see a number of cases of ehrlichiosis starting in Maine, then we'll start to put a flag up about keeping people's uh, attention on lone star ticks. Or if we start to see more rocky, cases of Rocky Mountain spotted fever, for instance, which is carried by the dog tick. We know it exists. We know that dog ticks can carry it. But so far, we haven't really identified many cases. So we're keeping an eye on these things. Yeah. The, um, the other thing is, I noticed the paperwork that's on the site for your Lyme disease information was last updated in 2015. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you know if there's an ongoing <laughs> update coming? I know the government and all that. But... <laughs> Yeah, no, the, the, <laughs> the, the state of our website is one of an area of ongoing um, <laughs> discussions <laughs> within my department. But thank you for bringing that my, to my attention. I'll let people know. Yes, I will. Thank you. Yes? Do you know if a mosquito can bite more than once? Yes. Or found out? Probably, yeah. No, mosquitoes will get blood meals until they a, die. I've heard it both ways. Some people say once a mosquito bites you, that's it. Like again, or whatever, but I always thought that the mosquito supposedly bit me and I was infected with something. Well, the mosquito bites. Blood in, go to somebody else and bites them and they yeah. blood on them, and they can get infected. Yeah, that's, that's typically not how disease transmission happens between mosquitoes. Um, and again, uh, once we become infected with something, it doesn't really transmit over to other humans. For Eastern equine encephalitis and West Nile virus, that's true. Malaria is a completely different story. So um, certainly malaria can be transmitted from human to human through mosquito bites. So, yeah. Okay. Yes? Have you heard of any reports of Lyme disease from doctors? No. I have not. So, but I am just one lowly field epidemiologist. So. How many of you are there field epi epidemiologists? Eight. Um, there's eight field epidemiologists, and then we have a number of uh, central staff epidemiologists who work in Augusta who do the data and numbers crunching and keep an eye out on the bird's eye view. So, yes? What's an MPH? Master's in public health. No. Yeah. Also, also known as the super nerd degree. Um, we're, uh, the, the Master's in Public Health program generally um, uh, gives you a broad knowledge of all things public health related, so you learn a little bit about um, epidemiology, which is the process of um, looking at data as it relates to population level, um, gives you information about um, biomedical stuff, it gives you information about um, environmental health and socioeconomic factors that relate to health, and then some of us go off and branch off into more specific details. And Did you write about text? Your master's program? I didn't, no, I was a, I, I focus on social behavior and community health, so I was really interested in, I, I, I kind of had a, a career jump. I went over to all infectious diseases. Before this, I was really in, uh, focused on HIV and STD prevention. So I can, I can tell you a lot about chlamydia and gonorrhea if you want to know, but we're out of time, so. Yeah, I'm going to call it, so if people want to keep talking, they can do it afterwards. I don't want yeah. people to feel trapped. Here, there's cookies and juice over here. Thank you for coming. November 8th, John Turk. He has circumnavigated Ellesmere Island Ooh. up across from Greenland by sea kayak and ski and foot. He's paddled all around New Guinea. He's paddled from Japan over to the Aleutians, sea kayak. And he spent a lot of time and been healed by shamans in Siberia. A very interesting presentation.
So thank you. Thank you very much again. We're going to let Emer. Yep.